it's heartening that this conversation is even happening. I mean, to hear the words child poverty um, uttered in this chamber over and over again and, and people digging into the issues um, is a really uh, impressive thing in itself. And this is going to take years and years, um, but uh, to be at the beginning uh, with this committee and, and um, helping make it happen is, is really exciting. So thank you for the invitation. Um, I've got three slides and, and I want to make sure to save time for um, uh, one of our allies, a parent who would be affected by Medicaid expansion, um, to be able to tell her story as well. Um, so pardon me if I'm a little bit uh, brief. We'll do the next slide. It's fine. Um, so uh, and you can just who is it? Oh, over here, <laughs> Paul. Just go through the whole thing. Um, so I'm going to zip through this. Go. You can let them all. There we go. Um, so this is a, just a summary of the report that we put out with um, the Center on Budget and Policy. Um, but I think it's really important to highlight some of these things because they dispel a lot of the myths that are out there. Um, so I'm just going to run through these quickly. Um, the problem uh, that we're talking about is not about fixing a couple of bad apple parents. It's about fixing a broken system. Roughly half of our kids live at or near the poverty line. So it's not going to be a tweak here or there or uh, punishing a few kids who are truant or punishing teen mothers or anything like that. I mean, we're talking about a systemic thing. 56% of our kids are on free or reduced lunch. As Ted mentioned, 48%, nearly half, aren't at self-sufficiency standard. So as we, as we hear and as the committee continues, um, we urge you to, to come back to that thing of how are we fixing the system. Um, one other thing that, that came up in our, in our research is that in many ways child poverty hurts more now than it used to. I mean, people will say, and this came up, we did a, a series of 48 community meetings, meetings with stakeholders around the state, and people would say, well, you know, it's not, when I grew up poor, um, uh, they'll say, and, uh, but it was, it was different then. And the truth is, it, it was different then. Um, we have historically high rates of addiction, of incarceration. We have historically high rates of grandparents raising kids or single parents raising kids. Um, and the low, we have much lower social capital. Um, so the rate of uh, uh, the union participation rate was 38% a generation ago. It's 13% now. So people don't have that uh, uh, sort of social capital. The rate of participation in church is dramatically lower than it was. So we don't have that safety net. And even our employment, um, it used to be someone had three or four jobs and your job, your employer, your uh, fellow employees were someone you could rely on when things went tough. Um, my one-year-old son, uh, it's estimated that he will have 30 jobs before he dies, right? So that, that sense that your job is something you could rely on isn't what it used to be. Um, again, as Ted mentioned, poverty is not inevitable. We've fixed it for our seniors. 75% drop in the last 40 years. So please don't let anyone get up here and say, well, the problem's just too big. We can't fix it. Um, as bad as it is and as, as much as we could fix it, it could get worse. Um, one thing that um, Ted didn't mention but is a pretty shocking statistic and um, I hope will be something this committee takes up um, is that we've got more than half of our 16 to 24 year olds who are neither uh, uh, in work or in school. Um, so if we don't address this quickly and forcefully, it could get worse. Um, uh, the statistic has been uttered many times before. It's worth uttering again. A dollar on early childhood, and this is quality early childhood that goes to poor and working families. So expanding child care or early child education for everybody doesn't have as high a return on investment as to the families and kids who need it most. Um, but $1 invested gets $7 in saving because you reduce crime, you increase employment, and you reduce severe uh, health problems. Um, the solutions um, are actually quite simple, but they're hard to muster the political will to do. And we heard this over and over again in the community meetings and in our meetings with stakeholders. Right? What we're talking about is the, the woman who uh, is my son's daycare teacher makes roughly $8.63 an hour. That's the average wage of a child care worker um, in West Virginia. Um, if she's supporting a family on that, that puts her at about $17,000 a year, which is less than half of what we just said was the self-sufficiency standard. Um, so how do you fix that? Well, either her way, you know, and, and she has a daughter my son's age and a four-year-old son, um, how do you fix those kids' situation? Well, either you provide higher wages and benefits for her, you lower the costs for her, 
um, and, you know, things like child care and medical care, those costs have gone through the roof um, in the last 40 years. Um, or you invest in, in human development. You find ways to help those kids get um, better early childhood programs or education programs. Um, one thing we keep coming back to, though, is it's going to take the political will to execute these social and policy changes. People ask, why did the senior poverty rate decline? And the main reason is because seniors are voting in huge numbers, and the share of the voting population that is above 65 has risen. So it took that political will. And the last thing I'll say is that um, parents are the solution and not the problem. Um, the times when we've had the highest rate of, uh, of, of parents involved in government voting, poor parents uh, in, involved in things like unions and churches, those were the moments in our history where our child poverty rate um, was lowest. Um, so um, that's something I'll come back to in a second. Next slide. Or next slide. Um, so um, we wanted to put together uh, some recommendations for the committee. Uh, in addition to representing the Healthy Kids and Families uh, Coalition, we were, uh, along with the center and a number of other groups, part of uh, putting together this campaign called Our Children, Our Future. We've been working for the last six months. Uh, we've done, as I said, these 48 community meetings and uh, uh, over 200 meetings with different stakeholders, asking many of the same questions that you guys are about what child poverty looks like in different communities and what we can do about it. Um, I don't have time uh, to go through all of this, but I want to hit some of the high notes. And, and these recommendations come uh, on behalf of, of this campaign. Um, one thing is, let's work together now. Um, so uh, out of these 48 community meetings and 200 meetings with stakeholders, we came up with 94 proposals for how to address nine, uh, child poverty in West Virginia. 94 is way too many, um, uh, at least for this year. So we whittled it down to 17 that we thought we could possibly move this year. And from those, we held a statewide vote and landed on 10. And you've got those 10 in front of you. Um, I am not going to go through all of them right now. Um, you can read them for yourselves. Many of you were part of the process that led to these. Um, but we do hope that you will work with us um, on them. I will come back to one of them in a moment. Um, but these are things that, by doing the things we just discussed, um, so yeah, this is, this is, the, um, this is the platform. Um, we want to make time um, at some point for the, the things that we think we can do right now. A lot of the big stuff is going to take years, potentially, to win. But there are things that are available right now, especially Medicaid expansion, um, that could uh, help child poverty in the state. Um, that said, I, I want to move on for a second and, and cover some of these other recommendations, because uh, we're really deeply excited and moved by the commitment by the Select Committee. And, and we want to be as much a part of the process and offer as much help um, as we can. Um, if, if, if there's one thing I can communicate today, and I'll do so by ceding the rest of my time here in a moment, um, it's that please be skeptical of people who attempt to speak on behalf of poor kids and families who are not poor themselves, including myself, including Ted. Be skeptical of us. We did these community meetings, and um, it is, it, Frequently what would happen is um, the loudest voices are people who wanted to tell you about this poor person they know who is a total screw up and did this, that, and that other thing wrong. And there is a lot of demonization and myths that are propagated when we let people who are not uh, in that experience speak for those who are. We, if we had a select committee on minority affairs, we would not have a majority of experts who are white. If we had a select committee on women's affairs, we would not have a majority of experts who are men. And I hope, um, and we're willing to work with you in many ways as possible so that you are doing this. And the, the forum in Fayette County is a brilliant idea. And, and uh, I want to invite you um, concretely. We, uh, the Our Children, Our Future campaign, we are doing 12 regional forums around the state. You are all welcome to attend those. We will be presenting our platform at those, and kids and families who are affected will be speaking at each of them. You have that calendar in front of you. But also, because I know you want um, uh, you know, your own forums where you're meeting directly face-to-face -face with kids and families, um, I reached out to uh, our partners. We have 160 <laughs> organizations and communities and unions and uh, chambers of commerce who are working with us on this campaign. And what you have here are a list of eight or nine who have stepped forward already and said, let the select committee know 
If they want to talk to kids and families in an unfettered, uh, you know, one-on-one -on -one environment or group environment, we will set it up anywhere in the state they want. You've got the SEIU Local 1199, the Boys and Girls Clubs, Family Resource Centers, Head Starts, Catholic Charities. These are all organizations that do a good job of lifting up the leadership and voices um, of poor kids and families and have offered um, to host this committee. So uh, you can follow up with me or with any of them uh, directly. Uh, third um, recommendation is um, we hope and we invite this committee to work with us on a summer policy symposium. So, you know, there are these 10 things that we think can be done right now, but, but a lot of the big fish, you know, whether it's the earned income tax credit or the early childhood education um, uh, overhaul or uh, perhaps something like revising our um, uh, uh, benefit structure so that in every possible way we are rewarding work because one thing we heard frequently from parents were you know I'm turning down raises because of the benefits that I will lose um, if I get this raise or this promotion so there's some that's been done to reform that but there's more that needs to be the bottom line though is that any on any of those big changes where we'd be real leaders at a national level um, that's going to take real in-depth study and work and we're going to hold, um, our campaign is already planning to hold a policy symposium this summer where we can really get into the weeds on some of these proposals, hear from experts, but also have the kids and families at the table um, at that event, um, at, at those symposia as well. So we invite the committee to uh, work with us in any way you wish um, as co-sponsors or even just participants in a symposium like that. Uh, number four, um, we would encourage you to authorize an in-depth study. Um, there have been in-depth studies in Wisconsin and Virginia where they say they look at particular policy proposals and say, let's crunch the numbers. Would this actually reduce poverty? Um, and uh, we'd be happy to come back and uh, uh, present on, on some of those. But something like that, you know, further down the line when we have some of these opportunities, these po possibilities to say, well, let's run the numbers and see if they would actually work. And then uh, finally, uh, we wanted to offer some uh, recommendations for future hearings. Um, you know, I, I mentioned some of these, you know, focusing on specific issues. Uh, there was a really great series of articles in the Gazette over the weekend about uh, the success story of, of local community efforts in schools in Mingo County, uh, where they're already seeing sharp results. Um, you know, the, I mentioned the Wisconsin or Virginia examples of where there have been uh, task force like this one that have also produced some uh, policy recommendations and, and reports. Um, one of the most exciting things, and I'm speaking for myself here, is a, pro a project called the Family Independence Initiative that tries to rethink um, how we do social services rather than, you know, just giving people something. It gives the power to the families themselves to lift themselves out of poverty. I'm, I'm not doing it justice. It deserves a full um, uh, 30 minutes or hour of your time. Um, but it's an exciting, different way to look at poverty reduction, and it's working. Uh, 